the director's cut of that interview, available on demand at marketplace.org. In New York, I'm David Brancaccio with the Marketplace Morning Post. From APM, American Public Media. You're listening to WHYY Morning Edition continues in just a moment. Don't forget to join Marty Moskowain of Radio Times and Mike and Scott of The Pulse as they lead conversations around the Me Too and Time's Up movements in a special event Wednesday, March 28th. This live event will include panel discussions as well as a chance for the audience to ask questions. Reserve your ticket at whyy.org slash events. This is WHYY FM Philadelphia, WNJN FM 89.7 Atlantic City, WNJZ 90.3 Cape May Courthouse, WNJB FM 89.3 Bridgeton, WNJM 89.9 Manahawkin, and WNJS FM 88.1 Berlin. The WHYY forecast for today shaping up to be a nice day, fair skies, mild temperatures, high near 60 tomorrow, rain showers in the morning with a steadier rain developing later in the day Thursday. Thursday's high near 56 and more rain ahead for Friday at 7 o'clock. Good morning. This is going to be an emotional day for students at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. They're returning to class today exactly two weeks after a former student opened fire and killed 17 people. It's morning edition from NPR News. The Cherry Hill School Board got an earful last night. A popular teacher was removed from the classroom for his remarks about school shootings and students and parents packed the room. That story and more coming up. We'll listen to students and teachers in Parkland, Florida as they try to move forward. I'm David Green. And I'm Rachel Martin. Congress is grappling with what, if anything, to do on gun control. We'll ask Senator Richard Blumenthal of Connecticut if he thinks the shooting in Parkland, Florida is a turning point in the gun debate. The president's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, will no longer be privy to the country's top secret intelligence reports. Will this mean his role in the White House gets downgraded, too? It's Wednesday, February 28th. Country music star Jason Aldean is 41 years old today. The news is next. Live from NPR News in Washington, I'm Corva Coleman. Students are returning today to Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Florida for the first time since 17 people were killed in a mass shooting two weeks ago. Since then, the students from Parkland, Florida have rallied and lobbied state lawmakers for new gun control measures. Sophomore Charlotte Dixon is anticipating the first day back in class. I never really thought that this would happen to me in the first place, so I don't really know what to ex expect, but... I've never seen a change like this happen with anywhere else, and I'm glad that it's my school making the difference. Florida lawmakers are weighing proposals to impose a three-day waiting period to purchase weapons. Some lawmakers back a plan to arm some teachers in classrooms, a proposal supported by the NRA. President Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, has lost his top-secret security clearance. NPR's Mara Liason explains. Kushner had an interim top-secret clearance. Now he's been downgraded to a secret clearance. That means he can no longer read the president's daily brief and will not have access to certain types of highly classified information. This downgrade also applies to other White House officials who had been working with interim security clearances. The president could give Kushner a permanent clearance, but last week he said he was going to let Chief of Staff John Kelly make the decision. Kelly has said that Kushner would be able to continue to do his job at the White House without top secret clearance, but officials from previous administrations say they can't imagine how Kushner can competently oversee relations with China, Mexico, and the Middle East peace process, among his other duties, without top secret clearance. Mara Eliason, NPR News, the White House. Separately, the Washington Post is reporting that four foreign governments allegedly discussed ways to manipulate Kushner. The report says they wanted to take advantage of his inexperience in foreign policy. The Post reports the governments are China, Israel, Mexico, and the United Arab Emirates. The United Nations ceasefire that was set for Syria has been repeatedly broken. Civilians are trapped in a suburb of Syria's capital, Damascus. Russian-backed Syrian forces have been shelling the suburb known as Eastern Ghouta. NPR's Ruth Sherlock says the ceasefire was supposed to allow civilians to escape. There's this corridor that was meant to be opening up for five hours a day in which civilians and the wounded are meant to leave and aid organizations are meant to get aid in. The space has been under siege for years and people are suffering from that nutrition, terrible wounded situation there. Um, and what's actually happened is the UN says the fighting is too bad, they can't get any aid in. NPR's Ruth Sherlock reporting. 
News reports say a panel of United Nations experts alleges North Korea has also been sending items to Syria used in ballistic missile and chemical weapons programs. UN experts are tracking sanctions against North Korea. They say they've discovered several previously unreported shipments to Syria dating back to 2012. This is NPR. Support for NPR comes from NPR stations. Other contributors include Little Passports, where every month kids can explore a new country when packages arrive in the mail filled with activities, souvenirs, maps, and stickers. Learn more at littlepassports.com slash radio. This is WHYY at 704. There are a few clouds about as the day gets underway. Temperatures are chilly, 39 degrees this hour, but they'll warm up to the high 50s. Good morning, I'm Mary Cummings, Jordan WHYY News. Jennifer Lynn is off today. At a standing room only Cherry Hill School Board meeting last night, dozens of students and parents waited at least two hours to lodge their outrage how school administrators handled recent events at Cherry Hill East High School. Teacher Timothy Locke was removed from the classroom after making controversial remarks regarding school safety and school shootings. That sparked a pair of walkouts by students this week. Parent Scott Seligman says the administration failed to properly address students and parents' concerns, especially Superintendent Joe Veloche. is out of touch with students and failed to acknowledge the personal connection between Cherry Hill East students and students in Parkland, Florida, site of the recent school massacre. More than 60 people spoke, both students and parents, in support of the students' actions and their teacher, and they called for better security at the school. While the board president mentioned the board was bound not to discuss personnel matters, the implied teacher was not suspended but did not explain why Locke has been out of his classroom. This week's annual state budget hearings are giving lawmakers a rare chance to speak publicly with Pennsylvania Supreme Court justices. As WHYY's Katie Meyer tells us, questioning at a Senate Judiciary hearing repeatedly returned to the court's controversial decision to invalidate and redraw the state's congressional map. The testifiers at the Judiciary's budget hearing before the Senate were Republican Justice Sally Mundy and Democrat Max Baer. Notably, neither justice took part in drawing the court's new congressional map though Baird did agree the old map was unconstitutional. Many questions from GOP lawmakers focused on one of the biggest controversies of the redistricting case, the 18-day timeline justices gave lawmakers to attempt to redraw the congressional map. Baird didn't defend the decision, but he did appear to reject a common accusation that Democratic justices made a purely partisan decision, calling the split vote a good faith dispute. They thought it could be done. They thought it was unpalatable to do an election with unconstitutional maps. I thought we couldn't get it done. You evidently agree with that. The majority felt they could. What can you say? As congressional candidates hurry to rebuild their campaigns around the court's new map, State House and Senate Republicans are still trying to get it overturned. They filed appeals to both the U.S. Supreme Court and a lower federal court. Katie Meyer in Harrisburg. In sports, the Sixers were singed by the Miami Heat 102-101. Phillies had a tough outing as well. Tigers with the 11-6 win in spring play. Bills are back in action today against Toronto. You're listening to WHYY. This is Morning Edition from NPR News. I'm Rachel Martin in Washington, D.C. I'm David Green in Culver City, California. Students are returning to class this morning at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. It has been two weeks since a mass shooting killed 17 people at that school in Parkland, Florida. Amanda Edwards is a student. She said many of her friends don't plan on going back for the first day. This is her plan. The president still supports raising the age limit to 21 for the purchase of certain firearms. Right, that was not Amanda Edwards. Uh, she said that if she gets scared during the school day today, she said that she would be fine leaving early. And she also said, what's the point of being at school if she's going to freak out half the time that there could be a school shooter coming in? So just hearing some of the fears that are still there in that school. And Paris Greg Allen is outside the school this morning. And uh, Greg, I guess um, you, you, some of the bustle is happening. It, it feels like a, a school day, but, but not anything close to a normal school day, I, I gather. No, I think this is as far from a normal school day as could be just about. Uh, it's uh, quite a scene here at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. 
you got a, a large group of law enforcement officers here, uh, a couple of hundred, I'd say at least, uh, from various jurisdictions, including out of state, plus, of course, a sizable news media presence. Uh, students are arriving. Many are carrying flowers. They come in. People are handing them flowers. There's a welcoming committee outside for a while, a group of students with a couple ponies and a goat. Uh, it's, it's, it's really quite a scene here, but uh, the students we've talked to, you know, uh, I think are many more kind of looking with some trepidation today, but, you know, feel that's the time to come back. Yeah, I mean, what what a moment um, trying to go to school with media attention. And I mean, is the school doing anything to, to make sure that the, the media and all this attention doesn't get in the way of, of getting back to, you know, school and homework and classes and lessons? Yes, I, you know, the, uh, the the school district here, the superintendent, Robert Runtz, he's been very solicitous of the students. Um, he's was very concerned about keeping the news media at bay today, asked that you know helicopter over flights. Um, so I think, generally speaking, the news media is being respectful. In terms of inside the school, you know, they have brief counselors. They'll have some of the, the, uh, the you know, the dogs that people use to kind of to kind of play with. Uh, they'll have those there. Um, well, the superintendent said that they've taken a lot of care today to make it easy on the students. And this is not about learning, he said. He was very clear about that. This is about coming back, reconnecting with the school, reconnecting with your friends. Just half days this week. And, you know, learning will wait at least until next week. Greg, these students have become um, well known around the country for being so outspoken as gun control advocates in the wake of this tragedy. Do you expect that to continue as, as they work their way slowly back into you know a, a routine of, of classes? From all appearances, I think these students and the movement they've started is not going away soon. You know, I think as you know, they have this uh, big rally in March scheduled in Washington on, on the 24th of March, and they're going to be rallies the same day around the country, uh, March for Our Lives, and they raised a lot of money for that, nearly three million dollars from people like Oprah Winfrey and and uh, George Clooney, and they've they've been in Washington this week lobbying Congress on the gun bills um, and planning for that march, and of course they've also been lobbying in Tallahassee and have had a big impact there on the Florida legislature and, and plans going forward there. Well, what are the plans in the Florida legislature? I mean, it, it sounds like there's been a measure to, to arm teachers, maybe, that, that's been advancing. How is, how is that being received? It'll be interesting to see. Uh, Robert Runcie here just spoke about that. So he's firmly opposed to that. I know the superintendent in Miami-Dade County is firmly opposed to that. It would be a voluntary program. I'm not sure it will happen if the school districts don't buy into it. Uh, the governor says he's opposed to it, so we'll see whether he's going to allow it to go forward. They are doing some things that people like, though, things like raising the purchasing age for guns to 21, a three-day waiting period, uh, and also allowing authorities to take away guns temporarily from people who have been de uh, deemed to be a threat to themselves or others. So there is some significant thing that everybody likes in that bill, but still some controversial things. NPR's Greg Allen uh, outside Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, as uh, students um, return to class uh, today. Greg, thanks. You're welcome. As Greg mentioned, some students from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School have been here in Washington in recent days meeting with members of Congress about gun control. Yesterday, Speaker of the House Paul Ryan tweeted out a photo of him talking with this group. In the tweet, he thanked them for sharing their stories. Then Marjorie Stoneman Douglas student Delaney Tarr tweeted back, quote, We spoke, you listened, but it's now time for action. We hope to see you follow through. So what, if anything, will Congress do? President Trump has invited members of Congress to the White House today to talk about measures that could prevent gun violence. To talk about what is likely, we are joined now by Senator Richard Blumenthal, a Democrat from Connecticut. He has co-sponsored more than one piece of legislation restricting access to guns. Senator, thanks so much for being with us this morning. Thank you, Rachel. Good to be with you. President Trump has talked about raising the federal age requirement for purchasing certain guns from 18 to 21. Let's talk about that in particular. Do you think that's likely? It could happen, but it's really a baby step when we need giant strides. The students who met with Paul Ryan yesterday and others in the Congress are demanding action, more than just cosmetic or minor steps. And so raising the age limit may, in fact, do some good, but it has to be accompanied by other steps, such as extending the background check, system to all purchases. Otherwise, there's no way to know what the age of a particular buyer is and a ban on assault weapons and high-capacity magazines and taking guns away from 
people who are a danger to themselves or others these as are a result all, of a court order. These are all things that you are proposing in some way, shape, or form. Let's break them down one at a time. Uh, let's talk first about a bill that you have proposed, bipartisan support here, uh, that would force states and agencies to comply with the background checks that are already written into law. Explain why this is even necessary. It's necessary because a lot of states are simply not reporting certain facts that would bar people from buying guns under the present background check system, including conviction. And one example is the Sutherland Springs shooter who should have been barred from buying a weapon because of a conviction in the Uniform Code of Military Justice in a court martial by the Air Force. It was never reported. So that's one step that's necessary simply for the present background check system to work. But how do you compel how do you compel that? I mean, if they're not being enforced now, how do you pass a piece of legislation today that would compel those those uh, states to enforce these laws? Essentially, the measure provides incentives, and that's why a major revision of the background check system is necessary because there should be better reporting and there needs to be more compulsory measures, not just incentives. In recent days, you have called for a federal law that would allow law enforcement officials to take guns away from people deemed to be a threat by a judge. This is something that's been on the books in Connecticut since 1999. How would this work on a federal level? On a federal level, a law enforcement officer like the FBI, knowing that the shooter in Parkland was saying that he was threatening schools or individuals would go to a federal magistrate, a judge, and seek a court order that would enable the gun to be taken away. Some guns temporarily, others perhaps for longer periods of time. It's worth noting, though, that this law was in place in Connecticut when the Sandy Hook shooting happened. So it's, it's not a fail-safe. It, it, there's no law that's a fail-safe, and there's no single measure that's a panacea. That's one of the lessons of all of these shootings. The mass shootings that have occurred in Sandy Hook and Parkland, Orlando, San Bernardino, but also the 90 deaths every day that result from gun violence. There is no one solution. Congress, I think it's fair to say, is unlikely to move on anything uh, without strong presidential leadership here. Are you convinced that you have an ally in President Trump when it comes to passing some kind of legislation in this moment? President Trump has been, at best, ambiguous and equivocal, rather than providing strong leadership. And if there is an answer in one word to the present logjam when it comes to gun violence prevention, it is elections. In my view, elections will be necessary to enforce a real popular mandate. And there is popular opinion, obviously, in favor of background checks and assault weapons and other common sense measures, it has to be expressed at the polls. What do you think is going to happen now? I mean, you talk about an age restriction, an age requirement change, rather. Is is that even likely? I mean, you call it incremental, but do you think even that has the votes to get through Congress? There will be, in my view, probably some effort to do incremental change, perhaps the so-called fix next, which provides more information to the present background check system without a federal database fixing that that system yeah and that could in turn involve a number of other steps but they will all be almost certainly incremental richard blumenthal senator democrat from the state of connecticut thank you so much for your time this morning senator we appreciate it thank you This is NPR News. You're listening to WHYY at 718. Jared Kushner, President Trump's son-in-law, has apparently lost his top-secret security clearance. 
what sort of classified information will Kushner now be able to access? Mara Lyason takes a look at 733 at WHYY. Doylestown Health, Heart, and Vascular Services support WHYY. Nationally recognized as a top hospital for quality and patient safety by the LeapFrog Group, Doylestown Health's Heart Institute provides therapies for even the most complex heart and vascular issues. With personalized care and precision medicine to treat valve disease, heart failure, irregular heartbeat, heart attack, and more. Learn more at doylestownhealth.org slash heart. That's doylestownhealth.org slash heart. We've got a mix of sun and clouds. Temperatures up to 40 degrees in the Philly area. And we could see a high near 60 today. A few clouds tonight and then tomorrow. Rain showers to start the day with a steadier rain developing later in the day. Thursday, Thursday's high near 56. From NPR News in Washington, I'm Nora Rahm. A group of lawmakers is expected to meet with President Trump at the White House today. NPR's Giles Snyder reports the meeting comes as Congress is under pressure following the mass shooting in Parkland, Florida that killed 17 people. President Trump is hosting the bipartisan group at the White House to discuss gun legislation. White House spokeswoman Sarah Sanders has said that one area of discussion will likely turn on raising the minimum age to purchase certain firearms, improving background checks is expected to be on the agenda as Democrats seem likely to push Republicans on other measures as well. The high school campus where the mass shooting took place is reopening for classes today. The exact building remains closed. State legislatures are considering demolishing it and replacing it with a memorial to those who died. In West Virginia, teachers have ended a strike after the governor proposed raising their pay by 5% starting in July. Classes are to resume tomorrow. The body of the Reverend Billy Graham will lie in honor in the rotunda of the U.S. Capitol today and tomorrow. Republican Congressman Robert Adderholt of Alabama says Graham deserves the honor. While I only had that chance to meet him one time, uh, Billy Graham was one of those people that you felt like you knew. His honesty and his openness in preaching the gospel made him seem like a close personal friend. Graham died last week at the age of 99. I'm Nora Rahm. NPR News in Washington. The Museum of the American Revolution supports WHYY and presents the Diamond Eagle of the Society of the Cincinnati. Now through March 4th, this jewel-encrusted medal, owned and worn by George Washington, is on display for the first time in Philadelphia since it was presented 233 years ago. Learn more at amrevmuseum.org. A-M-R-E-V museum.org. The Museum of the American Revolution. You don't know the half of it. WHYY is proudly supported by the Haverford Trust Company, the home of quality investing for more than three decades. Learn more at HaverfordQuality.com. It's 721, and we've got this traffic note for you. Jammed up conditions on the Pennsylvania Turnpike westbound, approaching Willow Grove. That's exit 343 again. Pennsylvania Turnpike westbound, approaching Willow Grove. Really backed up there, exit 343. Stay with us. This morning edition continues. More just ahead. from this station and from Lumber Liquidators, supporting rebuilding efforts in Aransas County, Texas, which was affected by Hurricane Harvey, providing material support and money to help rebuild public schools in the county. More at LumberLiquidators.com. From Carnegie Corporation of New York, supporting innovations in education, democratic engagement, and the advancement of international peace and security. More information is available online at Carnegie.org. From Baird, employee-owned and independent, Baird has kept clients' financial interests first since 1919. rwbaird.com has more information. And from the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation at macfound.org.
This is Morning Edition from NPR News. I'm Rachel Martin. And I'm David Green. Every state has a law mandating these buffer zones outside polling places where there can't be any campaigning at all. And these are laws the Supreme Court has long upheld. And today the court is tackling similar, maybe even stricter laws that bar political apparel inside polling places. Here's NPR's Nina Tobin. Until the early 1900s, election days looked nothing like they do now. There were no quiet lines of people waiting to vote in curtained off booths. Instead, election days were raucous, confusing, even violent affairs. Voters then, as now, often were split into battling ethnic and ideological tribes. Except that back then, the battles outside and inside polling places were often physical. Coats were torn from people's backs, ballots snatched from their hands, voters were threatened, and in factory towns, managers often stood at the polling place door to make sure that employees voted the, quote, right way. In the late 1800s, states began enacting laws to protect voters from harassment and intimidation. Soon, all 50 states had laws that banned electioneering outside polling places and usually even stricter laws inside polling places. In 1992, the Supreme Court upheld a 100-foot politics-free buffer zone outside of polling places. Today's case is about what goes on inside polling places, specifically whether states like Minnesota may bar voters from wearing apparel or buttons that bear a political message. Under enforcement guidelines issued for election day, poll watchers were told to ask voters to either cover up or remove any item of clothing, badge or button that supported or opposed a candidate, ballot question or political party or group, including those like the Tea Party or MoveOn.org. Also banned was any item designed to influence voting, including specifically Please ID Me buttons. The buttons were distributed by, among others, the Minnesota Voters Alliance, which acknowledged that by wearing the buttons and flashing their IDs, they were creating the false impression that Minnesota law requires a photo ID in order to vote. Enter Andrew Selick, the executive director of the Minnesota Voters Alliance. I just went in to vote in November of 2010. I was wearing a t-shirt. It said, Tea Party Patriots, don't tread on me. According to affidavits in the case, he was also wearing a Please ID Me button. I simply asked for a ballot, and then they refused me twice. The only explanation they gave me is that that shirt was political. The third time, he came back with his lawyer, and he was allowed to vote, still wearing his T-shirt and button. But because he could have been fined, Selick and the Minnesota Voters Alliance sued, claiming that his constitutional free speech rights had been violated. I think the fundamental principle is that I had a right to wear that T-shirt. Selick's lawyer, Wen Fa, argues that the Minnesota law unconstitutionally sweeps too much speech into a ban on political apparel inside polling places. In addition to just banning campaign-related speech like vote for Bush or vote for Gore, it bans passive speech. For example, the government itself conceded that this ban would also apply to people wearing shirts featuring the logo of the AFL-CIO or the Chamber of Commerce. Yes, says Daniel Rogan, who's defending the apparel ban. He did make that concession, but only if the ballot included a measure that directly involved either the union or the chamber. There's nothing nefarious about the apparel ban, says Ginny Gelms, the elections manager for Minneapolis. Most people who are wearing a t-shirt or button are simply unaware of the rule, and when asked to cover it up with a jacket or take it off, they quickly comply. And usually, you know, it's resolved without any further incident. Selig's refusal to do that, she says, was viewed as confusing to voters, disruptive, and designed to draw election judges into a dispute. Election officials worried, for instance, that people in the line would leave without voting if they thought erroneously that they needed a photo ID to vote and hadn't brought one with them. Indeed, she says one head election judge told her he was not sure he would serve again if the ban is struck down because he wouldn't be able to protect the judges he supervises from getting drawn into political battles. After all, Gelms contends, that's not what polling places are for. All those restrictions are there to help the election judges manage a calm and efficient process so that everybody who has the right to vote can get in, exercise that right, and move on with their day. 
In the Supreme Court today, lawyer Rogan, defending the ban, will tell the justices that a polling place, like a courtroom or a military base, is not a public forum where people can say anything they want. It is a government-run facility with a specific function. The interior of a polling place is designed for one purpose. It's designed to provide citizens a place to make their electoral choices and to ensure that those choices are accurately and reliably tallied by elections officials. Rogan fears that if the Supreme Court were to invalidate the Minnesota ban on political apparel inside polling places, the next step would be to revisit the Supreme Court decision on electioneering outside the polling place. Indeed, the lawyer for Mr. Selick refuses to rule that out. Nina Totenberg, NPR News, Washington. Ah, uh, Barbara Streisand. She's an iconic singer, actress, director, and a proud dog owner. So proud that in 2003, she took the new puppy on her opening <laughs> I love this little dog, and he bought it for me for our fifth anniversary. No wonder she loved her. That puppy was named Samantha after Streisand's previous dog, Sammy, who had recently died. And when Samantha passed away last May, Streisand wanted to let her Help us get to the drive is to go to 888-376-9692, or it's very easy to go to WNRC.org. You can see the list of thank you gifts there, mm -hmm. and this coffee, 12-ounce can of freshly roasted coffee from the Brooklyn uh, Roasting Company is a bonus. Thank you. You know, there's nothing like public radio, and here in New York, there is nothing like WNYC. Think about what you get. Think about the reporting. It's all fact-based. It's independent. And we answer only to you, the public we serve. And if you're relying on WNYC now more than 